AM 1480 WLEA. In segment one, the entire audio of the press conference from yesterday about the Livingston County Sheriff's Department finding out after all these years who that young girl was who was found dead in a cornfield in Caledonia in 1979. In segment two, Hornell Mayor Sean Hogan talking about what happened to Friendly's and how he hopes to get another restaurant in there. Next on News Talk AM 1480 WLEA, the Newsmaker Show with Kevin Doran. Well, the press conference about the identity of that uh, 1979 Jane Doe case, a teenage girl who was found in Livingston County's town of Caledonia. It started out with Sheriff Tom Doherty. We have identified our Jane Doe from 1979. Many of you know how long this case has gone on, how difficult it's been. Tens of thousands of leads followed up, so many hours of manpower, um, a stress on a small county like ours, um, just a lot of unknown that's gone into this case. And to finally be able to put a name to her, like I said, I, I can't even tell you how much it means, how proud I am of our sheriff's office, how proud I am of our community, and the teamwork that's come together to make this possible. Here, Sheriff Doherty lists all the law enforcement agencies involved in this case. The Livingston County Sheriff's Office investigators have been working closely with the Hernando County Sheriff's Office. We also have been working with the Monroe County Medical Examiner's Office um, as they are the ones who do the official identification and that was confirmed last week, uh, again in partnership. Um, we have also been working with the FBI um, and I believe Len's here. Um, Len Opanishuk is the special agent and we will continue to be working with the FBI uh, because we still have a lot of work to do on this case. Uh, we're asking anybody who is and was familiar with Tammy Jo uh, to call uh, a condensed line all into one, which is 1-800-CALL-FBI. Um, and I, I know many of you know the details of this case, um, but just briefly I will go over it. It was November 10th of 1979. This case is older than I am. Uh, I wasn't even born at the time, so that's how far this dates back. But this case has always lived in our hearts, and I think that's what's truly, truly remarkable about remarkable about Livingston County is is we never give up. We treat everything very serious, and especially this case to continue on. In 2014 alone, uh, investigator Brad Schneider, uh, who was leading this investigation, uh, has handled over 50 leads. So it's all always considered a cold case when it's that old, but it never went cold because we've all always actively been trying to solve it. That day on November 10th, 1979, the first person on scene was Joe Richlicky, uh, followed by uh, former Sheriff John York. The, the two of them uh, know more about this case and uh, the files there to prove it. Uh, so many members touched this case over the last 35 years. Um, it would take me weeks to tell you, if not months or years, to tell you all that the Sheriff's Office and our partners have done to bring this to a resolution. Again, uh, we are going to continue to work with Hernando County Sheriff's Office, uh, the FBI, and the Monroe County Medical Examiner's Office to continue this investigation. Because as I said, this identification is huge for us. I'm very proud of it. Um, but uh, this this colder case is now burning hot. And uh, the next step is, is bringing this uh, killer to justice. So at this time, I'll, I'll open it up for any questions that you do have. What does having this identity do for your investigation specifically in trying to catch someone? Yeah, we've always said that one of the biggest parts to solving a case is knowing your victim. Uh, once you know the victim, you know 10 uh, times more about the case. Uh, we know then who their associates are, what the motives may be, etc. Now, this is a very relevant point here that a reporter brings up during yesterday's press conference. Why did it take so long to identify her? It's not a short story. And uh, there was a DNA comparison on this, I will say that. Um, but it's not just DNA. Um, so 
we said over time that uh, I I've, I've personally felt that DNA would help us, and I'm not saying it did not help us, but there's still a lot of old-fashioned police work that's gone into this the last couple months. So the lead had come in over the summertime, and we've been actively working with Florida officials in our office. So This is another major point. No missing persons report was filed in 1979. How much were you hampered by the fact that there was not a missing persons report apparently filed at the time of her disappearance? Could this have been solved a lot earlier? Yeah, uh, the, the first missing person report came from the summertime. Is that upsetting? Absolutely, it's upsetting. <laughs> And Sheriff Tom Doherty there is talking about the summer of 2014. The sheriff here is saying how upset he was that it took until the summer of 2014 for someone to step forward and say, hey, I, I recognize that picture. Someone saw it online. It's, uh, it's disheartening. Um, but again, that, that goes to some background. And uh, the average person like you or I, if we lost our child, we would make a report right then and there. Uh, those details, I'm not going to go too in-depth because, as I said, we still have a, a murder investigation. But is that disheartening? Absolutely. Sure. How confident are you you're going to find her killer? I'm confident, just as confident as I knew that we wouldn't give up on the identity. We will continue to work just as hard, if not harder. Sounds like an obvious question. question or trigger when that caused this person to come forward and help start to connect the dots for you? Was there a, I know you guys were incredibly proactive with social media. Sheriff York dedicated almost his entire career uh, to this cause. Was there a particular trigger? Um, uh, a classmate. They came forward and uh, made the report down in Florida. And as I said, we get so many leads in. This has always been a cold case or deemed a cold case because of the, how old it is. But it's never been a cold case with us. If we got one lead, we'd follow up. If we got 100 leads, we'd follow up the 100. So there's been more time and resources put into this case than any other Livingston County Sheriff's Office case. That's how important it was. The timing on this, the ball store started rolling in Florida. It hit the internet. Social media can be a great thing. The information sharing that goes on there, then our office gets involved, etc. Sounds like Any an obvious question, but the passage of time, 30 some odd years, uh, makes that investigation that much more difficult, I would imagine. Absolutely. If it's a 35 year old investigation, yeah, we, but I can tell you this we have file cabinet upon file cabinet at the sheriff's office from this Jane Doe 1979 that we now know to be Tammy Joe Alexander. So we have a lot of evidence and we've got a lot of supporting evidence of things that we've done, things that we've ruled out. So what is your first step to go back, back so long? through the, that cabinet? And I'm, I'm sorry, can you repeat it? Is your first step now to go back through that evidence and match it against what you know about this girl and try to, I mean, where does your investigation, I guess, go from here? The investigation is started before this press conference. Uh, the point of this press conference is because we try and be as transparent as we can with the media and the community we serve, and we wanted her identity known as soon as possible. But the murder investigation uh, has never stopped. It's got, like I said, it's got a lot hotter. But, I mean, what will you be doing now moving forward? Will you recomb through that evidence and give it a new look based on what you know about this girl now? Yeah. I, I mean, all that goes into the, the now homicide investigation. Mm -hmm. um, but it's going to be a continue to be a partnership between Florida officials, uh, our sheriff's office, the FBI, etc. And it was at about at this point during yesterday's press conference at the Livingston County Sheriff's Department that a reporter, I believe from Rochester, asked if uh, Sheriff John York could come up to the podium. Question for Sheriff York. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Sheriff York, you dedicated so much time into this and effort. I know this was something that was very passionate to you. What's it mean to put a name to Jane Doe? Sure. Obviously, it's a very uh, bittersweet day. We always knew the day would come. Uh, we knew the day we found her, we'd bring this to resolve. I don't think anybody in this room doesn't know the passion this agency and its people has for solving crime. This agency's always been noted for making a difference in their community. Our people are some of the best law enforcement in this country. This case could have been solved long ago had she had a parent, had she had a family that cared enough to want to even make a missing persons report. With our partnership with the FBI, the state police, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, the medical examiner's office, 
the leads everybody ran, we knew it was just a matter of time. We knew someday, somehow, as Sheriff Dordery stated, the internet, social media was going to make a difference, and it did. We only needed somebody to report her. Once she was reported, the sheriff and his team did the rest. It was just a matter of time. What does this team mean for you personally? It's hard to imagine that somebody can just throw a child away. It's a great day to give her a name. The team did a great job and I'm very proud of them. I'll take a couple more quick questions. Does Tammy have any family down in Florida? I'm sorry? Does she have any family left down in Florida? There is family, yes. Any other questions? Does she have a funeral scheduled at all? Is anybody claiming the body, anything like that? Uh, we've, we have spoken to uh, the surviving family. Um, and, and she will be staying here in Livingston County. Um, there's been a obvious amount of love for, for Tammy Joe here. And uh, I'm honored that they'd want her to stay here. So we will be doing a very special service for Tammy. Now, from what I understand, uh, Tammy Joe Alexander uh, is buried in a grave at a cemetery in Dansville. Now, here's a question for Sheriff Doherty about the role that social media played in solving the case. Sheriff, one more question. You talked about the social media playing a role in this, mm -hmm. and it seems like we're trying to get a timeline of this. So they file a missing persons report, and then social media linked it all together. Is that correct? Can you just clarify this process from how this sort of unfolded? Yeah, your rough timeline is August of 2014 on a missing persons report. Okay. Uh, it hit on, into social media, which Investigator Schneider and our criminal investigators um, led by Captain Brian Applin and Chief Deputy uh, Matt Burgess, they, uh, like I said, they're, they're very passionate for what they do. They're, they investigate in a very aggressive manner. No lead would ever come into this office and just go, oh, it's just another bad one. They take them all seriously, and that's what happened in this case. It, it, the missing person report came in August, and uh, shortly thereafter, our office was involved with it. And again, we've been working with Florida officials and the medical examiner's office and the University of North Texas with the DNA comparison. So a lot of moving parts, but teamwork solves cases. And that's exactly what happened in this case. Can you but between that report being filed, yeah. Media it was? was it Twitter, Facebook? I mean, there's a couple different avenues. The, the initial report, the, the missing person report went into Hernando County Sheriff's Office. The social media then gets into all different type. You have all different groups on social media that try and help solve solve cases. Some private individuals, some public organizations. Uh, that lead came into us um, via an email plus a phone call, um, which then went into an official investigation. Is this person possibly our Jane Doe? The email and phone call was that somebody on social media a volunteer, an amateur person? or was that from a police agency? Um, Chief Deputy Burgess would have to answer that. Um, I believe that it was uh, a, a private individual that may have seen the missing person report in Florida, but I, I can't confirm that. And we can You can ask him some questions when I'm done here. <clears throat> Any other questions for me? Okay. Chief Deputy Burgess? Who's a private volunteer individual? Who had seen the report someplace? Or? Yeah, she, she had a sister who went missing in Florida in the early 70s and became very passionate in trying to help identify um, people who, who've been involved in crime and also um, finding missing people. So she has a background and a passion for this <clears throat> and actually was very in tune with what, with what was going on in Florida. So as soon as it came to her attention that we had a new missing person in the time frame, um, she immediately sent me an email. And I had communicated with her in the past. Chief, we talked about social media on this a long time. Yes, ago. we did. What's it mean to you after you know what we started out there? What's it mean to you to ha to have this come together via these avenues? It's this is a wonderful day for us, and uh, it's the end of one chapter and the beginning of the next one. Um, but it's something we're all proud of getting to this point. But uh, this is just one battle. We've got the rest of the war to fight to to find the person responsible for this.
Uh, again, I, I just want to, I don't want to single anybody out because as I said, this has been teamwork, um, but Investigator Brad Schneider is here if you have any questions after the fact. Um, he has led this investigation for us and I'm proud of him. Uh, Len uh, Opanishuk is in the back with the FBI. Um, and as I said up here, uh, Sheriff York, this case has always been near and dear to his heart. Joel Richlicky, uh being there that day, uh, also very, very passionate about this case. Uh, Major Clark Young, again, deeply involved in this case. There's so much history with our office and our members that when we say it means so much, it's we're not just saying that, it means so much. And, and I firmly believe that it means so much to the community as well, to just have this identification made. And I promise you, uh, like I said, th this case is burning hot and we are gonna be more aggressive than ever. So with that, have you heard from the public at all? I'm sorry. I haven't. Um, this obviously is, has been played pretty close to the chest the past couple months and especially the past couple weeks. Um, so it, it, it hasn't been public until today and, and that's now happening via the media. But uh, I'm sure and I'm confident that they will feel the same as we do. They're just very proud um, to bring this identity to this, this young child. Sheriff Tom Doherty there from yesterday's press conference in Livingston County about uh, how the Sheriff's Department were able to identify the girl after all these years uh, who was found in 1979 in a field in Caledonia. She's now been identified as Tammy Jo Alexander, who was from Florida. She was, uh, she was buried in Dansville, and her body will remain there. It's AM 1480 WLEA coming up next on the Newsmaker Show, our conversation from last night with Mayor Sean Hogan about the closing of Friendly's Restaurant in Hornell. Stay with us. Back on the Newsmaker Show, Brian O'Neill. We talked last night on the phone with Hornell Mayor Sean Hogan after we heard about uh, Friendly's closing down. The first thing the mayor wanted to say was that uh, that's a very busy area and uh, that Friendly's should be replaced with a new restaurant. Friendly's, of course, if you have not heard, closed down late Sunday night. Yeah, that's a very prime uh, piece of real estate where Friendly's is located. Uh, it's a very busy intersection, runs north, south, east, and west. Uh, there's an ex well in excess of 30,000 cars per day that go by the intersection. And the friendly closing really had nothing to do with the economy or, or no, nothing to do uh, with the lack of business. They were certainly busy enough. And I just had a conversation not too long ago with the manager, a young, a young woman from Buffalo, who was really uh, singing the praises of the store and how busy it was and uh, that it was a corporate store. Actually, Friendly's Corporation was uh, operating that store. They leased the property. Uh, Friendly's is currently going through bankruptcy and they've been closing stores all over the Northeast. And uh, Hornell is one of their, their busiest locations. I'm told that the landlord who owns the, the plaza and Friendly's there uh, wanted uh, to raise the rent, and friendly wasn't going to have anything to do with it, and uh, so uh, it just befell part of uh, became part of their bankruptcy proceeding, and they closed the store. It's unfortunate. I certainly feel sorry for the the employees and the people that work there. Uh, it's a corporate decision, and I don't know if it can be reversed, but I'm very confident that that location is a very prime location, and. Uh, Working with the, the owner of the property, I'm sure we'll be able to find a, 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 uh, a good tenant there and a good business uh, that will add to the community. So I'm, um, um, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, throwing up my hands and walking away. I think it's an opportunity. Wherever one, one door closes, another door opens, and we got a good opportunity there to try to bring something else in. And Mayor Sean Hogan thinks that the uh, Friendly's location will be revived in some way as a restaurant again. Well, I th uh, yeah, I think so. A restaurant of, of, of some type, and uh, a lot of people would like that. A lot of restaurateurs would like to have that location in that spot. So I'm sure when we reach out to the property owner, we'll offer our assistance and try to help them uh, you know, find a prime tenant for, for that location. Again, like I say, I'm sorry. Friendly has been a long time uh, member of our business community, and uh, was, uh, was a well uh, 
well-supported and well-liked business. But, you know, uh, you know, businesses do come and go, and they do, uh, corporations uh, experience financial problems. So, But uh, we'll work to fill the slot. Just as we work to fill the theater, we'll work to fill this. So uh, and everyone should uh, not lose heart and continue that. Like I say, what well, one door closes, another one opens. So Mary Sean Hogan there talking about what happened to Friendly's, why they closed, and uh, the information he got from the company there, and uh, Hogan hoping to get another restaurant in there sometime soon, hopefully. It's AM 1480 WLEA Hornell. I'm Brian O'Neill. Stay with us. News is next.